Uh, welcome to a new video. So, in this video, we're going to learn the flag register of 386. It's called E flags, extended flags. It mainly has the flags of 8086, which you know them very well. I've covered a whole video of one hour showing how these flags work because uh, th there are some interesting flags in it, like overflow and all. So, I'm not explaining them again. Please check out the video of 8086 flag register for that. Even in the exam, especially Bombay University, if uh, they ask you 386 flag register, stick more to 386 flags. That's what they want. If they wanted 886 flags, they would have asked you 886 flag register. Especially if it's a five mark question, your marks are here, not there. Of course, you've got to draw the flag register and get the pattern right, but don't sit and waste time explaining those. They don't carry marks in this answer. These are the flags. Okay? It's a 10 mark question, then of course, you've got to explain all the flags. Now, the first flags, IOPL. Remember what did I tell you in the previous video? There are four privilege levels. PL0, PL1, PL2, PL3. Whom do you assign privilege levels to? You assign privilege levels to entities. An entity can be either program or data stored in memory. In memory, everything is stored in a segment. Am I right or not? Segments are like files in the modern world. Everything is stored in a file. Tell me, do you agree? So you assign privilege levels to segments. Are you listening to me? Each segment has a descriptor. I'm going to teach you that. In that descriptor, you store the privilege level of a segment. This is a segment. This is its descriptor. It will tell the privilege level of the segment. You want to access the segment. Your privilege level will be compared with the privilege level at the descriptor. That's how protection is enforced on this segment. Segments are stored in the memory. Their protection is enforced by their descriptors. Now, other than memory, there is one more big component in a computer, I.O. If you want to access an I.O. device, you give the address of the I.O. device, like in AL, 80. You want to access data from I.O. device 80. This is what you've been doing since 886 days. Am I right or not? Now, whether you have permission to access this device or not, whether you have permission to access I.O. operations or not, will be checked by comparing your privilege level by the with the privilege level assigned to I.O. devices. Privilege level assigned to I.O. devices is what is stored over here called I.O.P.L. This is the privilege level at which I.O. devices have been placed. So suppose I.O.P.L. Now I.O.P.L. is two bits because there are four privilege levels. 0, 0 means I.O. privilege level 0. Similarly, P.L. 1, P.L. 2, P.L. 3. So suppose these two bits are kept as 0, 1. That means you have kept all I.O. devices at PL1, okay, at PL1. Now any program of PL0 can access it, any program of PL1 can access it. But programs of PL2 and PL3 cannot access it because this is higher privilege than them. Instead, if you would have kept over here 00, zero then only programs of PL0 can access it. You have placed I.O. devices at the highest privilege. On the other hand, if you would have kept these two bits as 1-1, one, one, that means you have kept I.O. devices at the lowest privilege level. Now all programs can access it. So you choose what privilege level you want to assign to I.O. devices. When I say you, it doesn't mean the end, end programmer, it means the operating system. Come on, you have common sense. If the programmer is allowed to change these two bits, then what are we talking about? Then obviously I will first of all make these two bits 1-1 one, one and tell I.O. devices the lowest privilege so that everybody can access it. Pick up protection. So these bits cannot be changed by the end user. They are changed by the system programmer who writes the OS. Are you all understanding? They are changed only at the highest privilege levels. Only programs of PL0 can affect privilege. Any privilege bits in the whole subject can only be affected by programs of PL0. Okay. Now, so that was IOPL. I hope you understood IOPL. So it's a privilege level assigned to IO devices. Next, NT, nested task. Now, if you don't have multitasking in your subject, this bit is of no use to you. Bombay University doesn't have multitasking, so this bit has nothing to do with the remaining part of the subject. But it's still a good bit to know, just to know. 386 supports task switching. It allows the processor to go from one task to another task. It's like you playing a game on your phone. And come show you. I'm sure you know what is task switching. You're playing a game on your phone, all of a sudden there is a call. If there's a call, the game is suspended, the call is entertained. So there is a task switch from one, ta one task to the other task. You go, you execute your call. When your call is over, what happens to the game? You don't restart the game, you resume the game. You come back and continue the game. This is not like an interrupt. An interrupt, interrupt was the one which just told the processor that there is a call. Whether to do a call or not is the concept of task switching. You're just leaving one program and going to another program. Task switching brings its own set of complexities with it. But it's a very uh, good thing to make the device real-time. That's why modern operating systems are called RTOS, real-time operating system. 
because in real time you attended the call. It's not, it's not like it got postponed and became the next highest priority task. It broke the current task and started as a new task. So that is called a nested task. If you're running the parent task, that's called a parent task, the main task. If you left it and go, go to a new task, if this task invokes a new task, that's called a nested task. Are you clear? So while you're doing the nested task, the NT bit is one. What is the significance of this? I'll just tell you. Uh, if it's not in your syllabus and you don't want to listen to it, ignore it. You know, you understood what is NT bit, right? If you're doing parent task, NT bit is zero. If you're doing nested task, NT bit is one. If you're the kind of student who wants to go beyond the syllabus and just know why is this bit created, there is something called as task state segment, TSS, task state segment. Each task has its own TSS. If you are doing a nested task, there will be a backlink to the original task. If you are doing the original task, there will still be a backlink but it will take you nowhere so it will be a null pointer. So NT bit indicates whether this backlink is a valid backlink or a null pointer and it is checked when you do task switching, okay, when you want to come back to the previous task. Anyways, so it is useful when you learn the topic of multitasking. Bomb University you don't learn that topic so you will never come across this bit again in the whole duration of 3 and 6. But it was there in the flag register and flag register is asked. So you just have to know what NT is. So in simple terms, if you're doing an nested task, NT will be 1. If you're doing the parent task, NT will be 0. It's as simple as that. Next, there is a don't care bit, VM and RF. VM, I've already explained to you. VM is virtual 8-6 mode. But any, all the modes, you start in which mode? Come on, come on, revision time. You start in which mode? Real mode. Why do you start in real mode? Because you have to set up the environment to enter protected mode. Mode. Now, once you're in protected mode, you cannot go back to real mode. But if you want to do an 8086 based program, you can go to a virtual 86 mode. That is this bit. If you make this bit one, you go to virtual 86 mode. Then again, you can make this bit zero and come back to, come back to, come back to, yeah, come back to protected mode. Never back to real mode. Are you clear? In real mode, these flags are not available at all. This whole feature is there only in protected mode. Can we? Did you understand? The last flag, resume flag. So there is an interesting way of doing uh, debugging in 386. In 8086, how do you do debugging? Single stepping, which is very slow. INT03, the breakpoints, which are good, but they are very vague because you never know where to keep a breakpoint. 386 takes it to another level. You can debug. Again, Bombay University, you don't have debugging in your syllabus. So you will not hear about this ever again, this flag. But sir, it's so strange. University just plays jokes on people. You have this register, but you don't have the bits of these registers actual purpose at all. So if they just want you to buy art like a parrot. Now I don't want you to do that. So I'm explaining to you what this flag is. If you're not from Bombay University, I'm sure you learn debug registers and test registers. Now, so there's something called as debug registers in uh, 386. To make it simple, you're doing a program in which you're calculating some amount. Okay, you're doing a financial application and you're calculating some amount. So amount is some variable that you want to know. At the end of the program, there's a message, your final amount is so and so. When you run your program, it runs. The amount is shown, but the amount is wrong. So when you run, you realize the result is wrong. Something has gone wrong. What do you want to do? You want to see where did the mistake happen. If you do single stepping, you'll have to go line by line throughout the program. That is too slow. If you do breakpoints, you'll have to randomly insert breakpoints without understanding the logic of the program. And suppose the program is 10,000 lines and there are a lot of loops involved. Why go to such loops where your amount is not even affected? Why waste time? The idea is your interest is to check out amount. You want to know what happens to amount. So you can keep breakpoints at individual variables. You do that even in C programming by using watch window if you used it. So anyway, so you can watch a particular variable. You say in the debug register, you give the variable amount. Of course, you don't, don't be naive. You're not going to write amount. You're going to give its address. But the point is you give the variable amount. So, suppose in the program, amount was being affected here, here and here. Now run the program. What will it do? It will stop at the breakpoint where amount was being affected. You can keep a read breakpoint and a write debugger, read debugger, but anyways, assuming that right. Get my point. So, I don't want to give you information overload, that's why I'm not telling you too much. Anyways, it will stop at the first place where amount was affected. So, what happens? You stop it, you see the result, it is fine. So, you know amount is fine. Then we'll stop at the next one. You see the result, oh, it is wrong. It got a wrong value. That means something went wrong in the logic from here to here. Okay, you do your debugging. Now you want to test it again. Second time when you want to test it, do you want to stop here? No, because here it was fine. But since you have kept a debugger at amount, it will stop at every instance where amount was affected. So do you understand it will unnecessarily stop here? Now, if it's if this is just one case, okay, you don't mind. All you have to do is press space bar. It is just this much effort. But suppose this is happening in a loop. Then you go crazy, keep skipping, 
this, though your interest was not to debug this at all, your interest was to debug this. Tell me, do you understand what my problem is? So, what you can do is, here, make RF is equal to 1. RF stands for resume flag. The name is enough. Resume flag. If you make RF1, it resumes from the next debug breakpoint. That means it will not stop at the next debug breakpoint, it will just skip it and go ahead. The moment it skips one debug breakpoint, the flag automatically becomes zero. That means even if this is happening in a loop, you'll make it one, it'll skip the uh, it'll skip the breakpoint, it automatically becomes zero. You'll make it one, it'll skip the breakpoint, automatically becomes zero. When the loop is over, the flag is zero. Next time an amount is affected, it will stop there. So this is what is used by the programmer to skip from debug breakpoints. That's why the name resume flag. It skips the next debug breakpoint after skipping the flag automatically becomes zero. That is your resume flag. That's your whole uh, new flag. So once again, recap and we go ahead. First, IOPL, privilege level assigned to IO devices. If you kept over here one zero, that means two. Only programs of PL0, 1 and 2 can access IO devices. Programs of PL3 cannot access. Are you clear? Next. NT indicating, IOPL is 2 bits, okay? Keep that in mind. NT indicating whether it's a parent task or nested task. If it's a nested task, NT is 1. This bit is don't care, reserve for future. RF, resume flag. If you keep this bit 1, it will resume from the next debug breakpoint. So, it's used to avoid stopping on unnecessary breakpoints. After one resuming one breakpoint, it automatically becomes 0. And VM, virtual 86 mode, it's used by the programmer to enter virtual 86 mode from which mode? Protected mode. These flags are available only in protected mode. Okay, that is your flag register. See ya.